Hi, everyone. It's Raga with Mind Rolling, and I am back with uh, someone I love a lot, and uh, his name is Steve Earle. Steve, welcome to the show. It's good to be here. How are you, Raga? I'm good. I'm good. Thanks, Steve. So um, I'm going to, I mean, geez, to go through the accomplishments, if you want to call them that, I mean, just the art of Steve that extends in, in all areas of, of what art can be, except, I don't know, have you done painting? Have you been doing any painting? I, I, I haven't been painting in the last, since December was the last time I painted anything. Um, I've kind of gotten into a thing of uh, my albums, Tony Fitzpatrick, a dear friend of mine in Chicago has done my album covers for years. He does a new piece every record. Uh, but I released a single for Record Store Day now, and I've, I've kind of beginning last year started doing the art for the Record Store Day single really? myself. And, and wow. so I did another one this year. I actually did two paintings for this year's single. And um, Record Store Day got moved back because of this thing that we're in right now. It's normally in April, and it's going to happen in June, I think. And um, so the single won't be out to them. But yeah, painting was the last art form I started practicing on any kind of regular basis really well i just about, said that it was about tony terry allen who's one of my oldest friends and teachers he's a he, he's a singer and a songwriter and makes real, real cool records he wrote new delhi freight train that little fleet did years ago but he's his day job is he's a visual artist and after i went through all the stuff i went through and got out of jail i started doing things a little different and i'd begun doing some other things i'd written a book and i was I'd started a theater company in Nashville and was doing all these other things. And I told him, you know, the first time I saw Terry after, you know, we hadn't seen each other in several years and I'd been through that rough spot. And, and, and I just went through the whole litany of what I have been doing. And he, and you know, the, yeah, I got the books coming, the records coming, the got started a theater company in Nashville. He said, <laughs> cool, man, don't you do any visual arts? And uh, <laughs> I started, I took that as a challenge and, or a double oh, dot really? there or something. I started <laughs> painting uh i just said that having no idea steve whatsoever except for the fact okay steve is incredible artist music artist actor uh writer uh performer and i just toss i'm just saying okay what what has he done okay art and there we go that's yeah, called yeah sorry i didn't mean to yeah uh, that is called a renaissance man that's just incredible um so one day uh and I, I have to do this, and maybe I'm going to need permission from your peoples, but um, uh, I uh, one day was with you, and uh, you said, well, just come along with me. I'm doing a rehearsal. And right. I went along with you, and I sat there with, like, nobody there, just me sitting in front of you in the band. And, right. and, you, I'm, and it's not like I haven't seen you before, and I have a, in concert in various places, but... Um, you played the mountain in that right moment. and i was just uh pretty well blown away it's been my steve earl theme song you know since oh, that thanks. time i've been playing that song a lot it i wrote it in 1999 for a record called the mountain that was a i i, I decided to make a bluegrass record and <clears throat> i don't know years ago um something Stuck in my head, Allen Ginsberg said that it's it's, a, it's meaningless to to uh, break meter until you learn how to write in meter in the first place. Mm -hmm. And so I kind of took that to heart. And, you know, things that I try to do something new, I try to get back to what inspired me to do it and, 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 and emulate that as closely as I can, as correctly as I can to begin with before I got off, I get off on any tangents of my own. Mm. So I made, I was able to do it because of where I was and the people I knew. I made a bluegrass record with was the best bluegrass band in the world at the time, the Del McCurry band. And I started writing songs for it. And I came up with this little two song suite, um, the, a song called Harlan Man and a song called The Mountain. And they're the same character speaking to you. One of them, he's young and, and, you know, full of piss and vinegar. And, you know, he's a minor and he's proud of it. And, um, and he's a union guy. And uh, and then the second one, it's it's after in his part of the world, which is it's, it's about eastern Kentucky, um, that those two songs are. Um, mm -hmm. Mining yeah. has sort of gone away as a way of life, and the unions have gone away as a way of life. And, and it's an older man 
looking back on all that in his life. And that's the mountain. That's what yeah. that song is. So yeah. Yeah, uh, yeah, we so ended up I just be, we just in the middle of all this chaos, uh, a play that was written by Jessica Blank and Eric Jensen. And I wrote the music for it called Coal Country just closed at the public theater a few weeks prematurely. Mm. Um, and it was the, it's the story in their own words of the survivors of an explosion that happened 10 years ago um, this week on, in West Virginia, a mine called upper big branch. And uh, the script is based on interviews with the folks that, some guys that were there that survived and and the family members of the guys that didn't survive and i wrote six new songs for it but when we went to do those interviews um i for some reason got out my guitar and played the mountain for <laughs> gary quarles who's one of the the miners who he's a retired miner he lost his son in that explosion mm. and i played that song and um we just he, he cried and i cried and we we ended up putting it in the show it was the one song that wasn't written specifically for the show. And I've been playing it, you know, eight shows a week for the last several weeks until um, coronavirus shut us down week before yeah. last. And then, um, and we bailed out. Oh, and I have to, uh, you know, I have to do a shout out here because the way that uh, Steve and I know each other is through uh, a, a very close mutual friend, Danny Goldberg. So Danny, yeah. shout out to you. And uh, so, Steve, I, I mean, you know, for those of you, I can't believe it. If you don't know Steve's music, well, of course, we're going to have links like crazy up on the show notes once this podcast goes up. Uh, but I bet you know him through The Wire and other shows, but particularly The Wire, which he had a great, uh, great, great role in it. And um, but uh, can I, Steve, I want to play. I want to play the mountain. So everybody, I mean, you know, it's like, I am so, music is everything to me, has always been since the days that I ran a, a radio, a, a rock and roll radio station as a program director when I was like in my early 20s before I went to India. It's how I met Ramdas. It's a, a, you know, my famous story. And so uh, that moment, I mean, I'm, I don't want to make too big a deal at it, but that moment in that in that hall when you were rehearsing and played that song. And by the way, you played that song like it could have been, a you know, 10,000 people in there or just me. I mean, there was no difference. And I knew that well, you were there. You <laughs> right. An yeah, exactly. That really constitutes an audience. Yeah, exactly. So so I want to play it now. And um so I'm going to let it spin and then we'll worry about the record company and all that stuff. I'll, I'll talk oh, to you yeah, about, about that. that. We'll, we'll yeah. sort that out. Yeah. All right. So actually I own that one. I can give you permission right oh, now. Oh, there you so. go. Okay. Everybody, Steve, I got the <laughs> direct permission. I the yeah. Record I <laughs> yeah. Okay, great. All right. Here we go. The mountain. Man, this man. 
she holds me, keeps me from worry and woe. Well, it took everything that she gave, now they're gone. But I'd die on this mountain, this mountain. The Mountain, Steve Earle, a seminal song for me. And, uh, you know, just thank you for that, Steve. I really appreciate it. Um, so, um, okay, we need a little bit. You know, whenever I talk to somebody the first time, I kind of want to get from them, you know, what are the causes and conditions that make that person who that person is now? <laughs> and uh, and you got a bunch of them. But just tell, I know you grew up in, in uh, San Antonio, just a little bit of what some of those causes and conditions were that led you both into um, into what who you are today and the music, as well as what uh, the suffering. Gotcha. Um, well, I'm from San Antonio, Texas. Um, I mean, I, I moved there. Uh, my dad's from northeast Texas from a place called Jacksonville. And he was an air traffic controller. So we moved quite a bit. Um, you know, I, um, I was actually born in Virginia while he was still in the army, but we were there like a month and then went back to Texas where he grew up. And then we went to El Paso first and Lake Charles, Louisiana. And then by the time we were in the second grade, I was in San Antonio. And that's where I lived there from then until I left home. So that's home to me is San Antonio. I think, you know, it's where I came of age as it were. And, um, and um whether i was old enough or not and um if we didn't get into college we were probably going to vietnam and i was no way i was going to get into college because i didn't even manage to finish high school and um i never wanted to do anything but what i do which is play music i i at a very early age i, I started playing guitar you know by the time i was you know like 11 12 um, music was absolutely everything. My uncle, who was five years older than me, lived with us for a while. I got my first guitar from him. I got my first Beatles, Stones, Dylan, all that from him. Um, I had another uncle, my dad's brother, who I got my first Hank Williams, Bob Wills, all that stuff from him. He was the best nine-fingered piano player in Northeast Texas. And so I got the country music from him and the rock and roll from from my uncle Nick. And um Music was everything. And I grew up, I was lucky enough to grow up in this era when music, rock and roll became an art form. And my, my, my theory about that has always been, it's always, it's about the lyrics. I think the lyrics are what elevated, you know, rock and roll to a true art form. I think otherwise it would have been cool 
but it still it would have been just songs about cars and girls and and you know and then bob dylan comes along and changes everything and and it's not bob by himself it's that moment when bob wants to be john lennon and john lennon wants to be bob dylan and all of a sudden the bar gets very high and people start making incredible records during the period that i'm in junior high and high school and getting out on my own and then when i was 17 years old i'm playing coffee houses because i'm not old enough to play places that serve liquor and at least legally i did not do a place every once in a while and i'd find out how old i was and i'd get run off but um i played coffee houses because that i could get in and i got exposed to a lot of acoustic music more than I did um, electric music simply because my my dad wouldn't let me have an electric guitar and I couldn't make my guitar sound like that. And I loved Jimi Hendrix and I loved, you know, Jefferson Airplane, but I, I gravitated towards, you know, Dylan and Donovan and um, um, just um, the, the acoustic stuff on the Beatles records and the acoustic stuff on Rolling Stones records. Those were the things I learned to play because I could make my guitar sound like that. So, <laughs> and then uh, when I was 17 years old, I met Towns Van Zandt. Mm. And so suddenly, you know, there, I, I didn't know there was any difference between Towns and Bob Dylan. His the records were in the same, you know, record stores. And so I, to me, I didn't know it had any idea he was any less famous than Bob Dylan from my viewpoint at first. I found that rapidly that wasn't true, but, but uh, I got to know him, but, um, but the, you know, there was a scene in Texas. Um, there was, I'm from San Antonio, which is the most conservative town in the state, you know, in those days, especially five military bases and the Vietnam war going on. Um, I'm hanging out at a coffee house called, the Gatehouse, which is in downtown San Antonio, the local underground newspaper was published upstairs. It was called the Eagle Bone Whistle. And so I got exposed to when I was 14, 15, 16 years old, I'm going to the Gatehouse anytime I can get out of the house on the weekends, especially. And I dropped out of school when I was 16 and spent more time there then. And, um, you know, I, I started, um, I started, I read, I read Be Here Now when it came out, you know, and, really? and then read it three, three or four more times, you know, um, trying to, to kind of catch the wave on it. And, but the first time I read Be Here Now, I guess I was, what, 16, 17, when was it published? 71? 71. Is that yeah. Right? Yeah, yeah. 71. So I was, I was 16 years old. It was the year I dropped out of high school. It was the year that I read Be Here Now. But those, those are coincidences. Yeah. Well, um, wait a minute. Why? How, what happened? How, dropped out. That, I mean, you know, my parents. I I wanted to drop. They wouldn't allow it. You know, they locked me up before I'd be doing that. How'd you manage that? What was going on there? What do you mean? How, how was what going on? Uh, what? You dropped out of school. How did they let you? Oh, drop? oh. How did I do it? Well, I I ran away from home the first time when I was fourteen and went over to Houston. And my parents did not deserve that i did it because i was looking for an adventure i didn't do it because i was running away from anything it was just sort of you know i'd read a lot i'd already read i read bound for glory and i took it very seriously <laughs> you know, i read a lot <laughs> and uh the day that i finally took too much acid and my dad <laughs> had to be called i mean i took a lot of acid i and and i i always had a problem with drugs in the sense that I didn't, I never did it the same way everybody else did. I, I took acid as often as I possibly could. And, and and my major LSD thing, there was still real live, you know, lysergic acid diethylamide 25 around because I'm yeah. 69, 70, yeah. uh, 71 is most of the acid that I took. And Owsley went to Austin too. <laughs> there was an LSD culture in Texas, I think, that was stronger than other places in the middle of the country because there was a direct connection between Berkeley and Austin. And yeah. underground comics are part of it, and LSD's part of it. And um, the, the only time I ever, um, I got a big laugh out of Ramdas once because I, you know, I said, we were just talking about God, and I said, well, I don't know anybody that's taken real lysergic acid diethylamide 25 it doesn't believe in god <laughs> and, and he thought that was really funny and, and it's true that's always my answer i don't have to, i don't really try to look for any evidence but so it's a big part of who i am 
I, I, I did develop a problem with acid, just like I did other drugs later. Um, so I had that in my makeup already. But, mm. but I also, um, there is something to be said, and, and I can tell the difference. The people that, I didn't trust people that had never taken acid at one point in my life. And, and I, I, I find that to be a little embarrassing now, but there is, it is a little easier for me to understand people that had their whole world exploded and put back together again at one point in their <laughs> lives. It just, there's some things I don't have to explain to those people. Yeah. A little more I trust. Guess, basis important to, yeah. if, if that makes any sense. Yeah. Um, no that, trust. That's, trust. Yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm with you right there. You know, it's, the yeah, same it's just me. one of those things that it's just, you know, we really were looking for something and, and, um, we found more of it, I think, than people give, give the generation credit for. Um, mm. I don't think that every, that, you know, there's this perception that the sixties happened and it really begins in the fifties. I have this theory about, you know, when they say the sixties, the seventies, the eighties, I think if you're going to take arbitrary numbers and math and, 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 and apply it to history, you should divide the decades at the fives. I was born in 1955, which is the year rock and roll was invented. And um, once and for all, anyway, it becomes rock and roll at that point. They call it that at that point. But it's 1955 to 65 have a lot more to do with each other than 1950 to 1960 do. Because right in the middle of the decade, for a while there, it seemed like big changes happened. And shit started changing in 1965 in a big way. And I understood that a little bit. I mean, I read stuff like I'd already, I was taking acid, but I, when, when I finally took too much and my dad had to come home because I, I, I had, you know, uh, you know, bad trips are anxiety, anxiety attacks when you're on acid. That's all they are. And I know that now, mm. but I didn't then. And and I did take too much all the time. I, you know, I was one of those those dumbasses that would like. Oh, take half. I'd take two, you know, and I, was just, I took really super. I was not a micro doser. <laughs> and, you know, I, and I was doing silly stuff too. Like I had one particular hallucination sitting in the back of a car where I, I held my hand up and I was sitting, it was like kind of, you know, the back of a car in a parking lot, you know, we're kids riding around, you know, and, and that's what you can do. You took all your drugs and cars to the only place you could go. And I started turning my hand and all of a sudden there were all these other hands above me, beside me, behind me. And I could see the ones that were behind me and they were all different colors and solid, you know, like day glow colors. And when I turned my hand, they all turned with my hand and I could go back and forth. Wow. And I did that for the, you know, the hour and a half that I was peaking. And then I, then I took way too much acid for several years trying to get that to happen again. I just didn't understand <laughs> it wasn't supposed to happen again. And I kept trying to do it. And, um, you know, then I finally took too much of, of some really strong acid that may have had something weird. In it. I don't know. But at any point, my, I got obsessed with my heartbeat. It got too fast. And my mother called my father. Cause I, I, I freaked out a little bit and yelled for my mom and um, I think I was 15 mm. and my dad was an air traffic controller and he came in off a shift and he gets into my room and there's that, remember the old paperback edition of the electric Kool-Aid acid test yeah. with the psychedelic sugar Tom cube Wolf, and the wrapper yeah. on the cover of it, the blue yeah. cover. Yeah. I had, there was a copy of that laying at the foot of my bed and he picked it up and he said, read any good books lately? <laughs> he kind of <laughs> threw it at me half-heartedly. But, um, you know, all those things, I knew that, um, you know, the electric Kool-Aid acid test is how I found out about, you know, who Neil Cassidy was and through that, who Jack Kerouac really was and who Allen Ginsberg were. I backtracked to, the, to the, the Sun Elvis records the same way from hearing Credence records and Beatles records, you know, so it was just a, a function of my age, being a little younger. I was the kid that hung out with a lot of older hippies that were like five to 10 years older than I was. That, that was my culture mm. um, from the time that I left home when I was 16 years old. Right. Uh, amazing. So, all right. This is kind of interesting in terms of, I mean, even if you did take a little bit too much acid, I mean, Ramdas took a little bit too much acid too. Right. <laughs> uh, and so even then, but you know, you, and as you said, you, I mean, who, who would you be talking to except and really vibing with and trusting except people who had that experience? And I completely identify you with you that way. Right. 
Um, so right. but and I was, what, I've learned I've learned to be a little more open about that because um, for one thing, I'm getting older and there's younger people that come along that just uh, what, what they know about those drugs are club drugs. And it's not the same thing. And, um, you know, uh, uh, it, it is a prejudice. And so I try not to practice it anymore. I'm, I'm trying to I'm trying to evolve. <laughs> but uh, <laughs> but I, it, it was a thing. It's where I started. And for a long time. Um, I do have a special bond with those people that, that I don't have to explain that to. Yeah. Yeah. No, great. But so, but what interests me is, so, you know, as we go along here and you start performing, uh, you know, you're, you're in Nashville and you're meeting all kinds of, you know, amazing people, as you say, you're a little younger. And then at some point addiction creeps in and I'm, what I'm hearing from you is it's, it's not like you had a really um terrible household environment no not at all or any of i have that. no it's mm -mm. my disease is my disease i mean there's some um other addicts and alcoholics in my family but in the generations before me i believe it is inherited to a certain extent um recovery is also inherited my grandfather started every 12-step meeting in northeast texas like got sober in New York City, right after World War II, new Bill W., new Dr. Bob. And see, that's a big deal. That's kind of the core of my spiritual system and really getting a, a spiritual system that I practice every day begins with that. Mm. Uh, I mean, I was, I was a spiritual person. I believed in God. I never didn't believe in God. I believed, um, I, I knew about meditation. I knew about yoga. I knew about all those things. I read Be Here Now, like I said, and I read a lot of other stuff. But, you know, I, I still was, I, I was interested in art and a lot of drugs. And, and I just didn't, um, that I, I applied an amazing amount of discipline to making sure that I got some art made, which kept my my disease at bay for years and years. Now there wasn't time to develop a spiritual practice. And I think that's why it eventually got me. And uh, uh -huh. it's because there was just no room for that. I, I didn't have any problem with it. I didn't, I wasn't, I'm not afraid of God. I believe in God. I like God. I just never, I, I just thought it wasn't my thing to do. And I, and, and I still sort of, you know, it's not Santa Claus we're talking about. There's a God, whether I believe in God or not. And, and I, I, my belief is that there is. Um, and, and if there's not, I'm okay with that too. But I choose to believe that there is. And I believe that with, my, with every, that's belief. That's what it is. And um, it doesn't have anything to do with an afterlife. It doesn't have anything to do with the reward system for me. I'm not sure it has anything to do with creation for me. I don't think it doesn't. I just don't think about that very much. It mm -hmm. comes from 12-step programs. When people ask me, um, you know, and especially in the program, because some people have come to the program with real issues about God because they, they got abused by religious practice at some point in their upbringing, and it makes it really tough to, to get some it's a spiritual realm, trust me. And um, it's, um, I talked to Ron Doss a lot about this. He was really, really fascinated with the whole idea of Bill Wilson and, and the people that started Alcoholics Anonymous. And, and he, he, he had thought about it a lot. And um, it, um, it's a spiritual system. And, and it's the way it's going to be remembered. Bill W is going to be, a sort of a saint. I really truly believe that. And, and to a lot of people and, um, but it's just, um, you know, that idea that basically I believe there is a God and it's not me. That's <laughs> pretty much it. <laughs> but that's as far as I've gotten. And the rest of it, if I can keep that, uh, and there's also a thing in 12 step programs that I think is kind of useful to me and works for me. And that is, and I, I just learned how to do it. I've been sober 25 years at this last September 13th. Mm. And I just, when I got to the for number one, right at 20 years, I came the closest to using that I have in the whole time I've been sober simply because I had a lot of stuff going on in my life that was hard. And, um, you know, um, 
just life stuff, but it, a lot of it kind of came down all at once. And I really thought about it for the first time in a long time, but I didn't because I kept going to meetings and I kept calling my sponsor and I kept sponsoring people. And I think my sponsees saved my life more than anything else. Just being responsible to them and not wanting to somebody to go see that didn't work and then go out and die. Mm. And, and right now, Raghu, people are dying. My, my, my home group, it used to be, um, people would relapse and most of them came back, you know, with their asses kicked and they didn't, none of nobody said it was better out there. And they were a large part of my recovery. <laughs> I didn't have to do it myself. And I've never had to find out for myself. Now there's fentanyl out there and they go out and they don't yeah, come back. Yeah, yeah. They died the first shot of dope that they do when they go out. So it's yeah. a nightmare out there right now. And with this happening, God knows that's not going to get better. Yeah, no, uh, that different. commerce is not going to stop. There will be no social distancing in the drug trade. Trust me, yeah, it's just yeah. not the way that that works. So, so at any rate, I I like um, it's. I think it's uh, it is what reconnected me to spirituality, and eventually, you know, led me to a spiritual. I finally had to have a spiritual practice outside of the program itself but in the point one thing we do in the program with what we're taught i did not do it till recently is when we pray we pray only for knowledge of god's will for us you don't ask for anything else right and the reason we don't is not because it's, it's supposed we're just being taught as a higher form of prayer the reason we don't is it's not healthy for us as addicts to be in the results business because we're people that have been trying to rig the results our whole lives. Think that we're supposed yeah. to feel better than everybody else, that we're not supposed to ever be miserable and that we have the solution to, and we can push buttons. And, and it's just not true. And all that stuff stops working eventually. So, so because of that, we're told, and we're, and we're told to keep it simple. We're just simply taught, Pray for God's will for you. That's it. Don't right. You know, and that that's I, it across God the board. I figure God doesn't do parking spaces anyway, but yeah. but I try to keep. <laughs> well, it you too. never know. You never know. But yeah, that, well, that, that, <laughs> it can hurt. It yeah, can hurt. Yeah. But <laughs> that's hard. true. You know what, Steve? That's true for everyone. This yeah. this to to pray to a res, as you called it result oriented prayer is uh is 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 actually in my mind, naive, juvenile. It's, it's part of how we grow up in this kind of a culture. Right. It's, it's what we are told we need to expect uh, results. Uh, a rewards-based spiritual system. I mean, yeah. the idea of an afterlife is sort of rewards-based too. And I'm not yeah. saying there's not one. I'm just saying I don't do this because I think I, you know, I, I do see the danger, especially as an addict of being, oh, well, if I do this and do it this way, then, then, um, I'll get to go to someplace good or I'll get yeah, to go to someplace yeah. bad. I just don't, that yeah. doesn't work for me one way or the other. I've never been someone that thought about the consequences before I did something fucked up anyway. Yeah. When I was doing stuff that was fucked up, I just did it, you know, yeah. and so I don't think it's going to stop me. Right. Right. So, was, all right. Uh, so let me, let me ask this. Um, I, I don't know if you've heard Ramdas talk about this or any of us talk about this, but uh, way back in the day when we were in India with our guru, Ninkaroli Baba, he would say, suffering brings one closer to God. And you had a shitstorm of suffering. You ended up in jail. You were sentenced for a year. You got out after four months for drug-related stuff. So y you've had your share. Could you look at that? Is that something you can, you know, connect with the reality of the suffering, which has led you to who you are today and revealed? Well, yeah, it's definitely a big part of it. I mean, like I said, I don't think I would have ever consciously con practiced any um, spiritual practice at all until I was forced to do it because I finally bottomed out and I got and bottoming out for me was I got locked up. I did not stop until they locked me up. Now mm. I suggest go to the Betty Ford center. It's a way better deal than what I had to do. I detoxed in jail. I got into a treatment center because there were programs available, but only because I was so sick, they were afraid I was going to die in the, in the Metro jail here in Nashville. And the sheriff didn't want me to die in her jail. So, they um 
I got sent to a very bare bones treatment center in Honewald, Tennessee, uh, called um, Buffalo Valley. And it was, um, there's two things in Honewald, Tennessee is famous for two things. Meriwether Lewis killed himself there. And there's an elephant sanctuary there. Really? Where people where circuit, retired circus and zoo elephants and live. There's five or six elephants living in. Back then, I think there were two. And so that was the joke. If you bailed out of the treatment center, you might run into an elephant, you know, like right off the bat and come screaming right back again. But um, <laughs> I didn't go to get sober. I was in jail and I was given a chance to go to furlough out and go to treatment. And I went to get out of an orange suit. And I thought when I got feeling better, I'd walk away from there. So, um, but something changed. I had, um, in increments a profound spiritual experience that made me believe that I didn't, that number one, that I, that I wanted to live and that I could, that there was a way I had not been able to, I tried to stop taking drugs several times in my life and I'd never been able to do it. But I grew up with the 12 steps and the serenity prayer on the wall. And, and, but I was just watching a movie called my name is Bill W with James Garner and, and um, who else is in it. And, and it's about the founding of, of 12 step programs. And it suddenly dawned on me who the guys that were sleeping on my grandfather's couch were. Uh. And I connected at that point and it's grown and grown for years. And then to get to this practice outside of 12 step programs, um, you know, there were, there was worse moments than being in jail. It was the bottom, um, and, and, and there was embarrassing things. I mean, you know, being on tel- drug out in front of television cameras, every time I went to court, there was cameras in my face. Um, and my teeth were missing by that time. Mm. I-, I can remember, I think the low point was they were shooting a movie in Nashville, in South Nashville, and I was hanging out there because it's where the drugs were. And they were using a hotel that we normally hung out in, and it was the nicest hotel on the drag, but but it was still a place where, you know, stuff happened and but they cut the place all cordoned off and police keeping everybody out and they were shooting it river phoenix was last movie um it was about songwriters in in nashville young songwriters in nashville a couple of friends of mine were in the movie in small parts and extras and i could see them across the road i was walking on the other side of the road and keeping my head down and just because afraid terrified somebody was going to recognize me and then i got to where i was going and i looked at myself in the mirror and I had dreadlocks out to here just because I hadn't combed my hair and a really scraggly beard. And I didn't wear a beard a lot in those days. And my front teeth were missing. No one would have recognized me. Not in a million years. I didn't look anything like the guy they would have recognized. And that was a delusion that there was any danger of any of those people. over there. Those people might as well have been on another planet and they were just <laughs> on the other side of Murfreesboro Road. So that's what I feel like was the bottom. And um, you know, I don't know what happened except that I got locked up and I saw that movie. I started trying a little bit. And the next thing I know, I got out of jail and I made the free world choice to go to a meeting the day after I got out of jail. Mm. And that started this thing that's, that was largely just, it was a spiritual practice, but it had no other purpose to keep me from using ever again. Uh, mm. a life started coming back to me immediately because I, you know, I made records and people seemed to still care. And I started touring a lot and working a lot. Um, and then when I really, really, my, my, my sponsor years ago, when I had three or four years and I, this, he actually was a guy that brought a meeting into the treatment center where I was. And then I walked into this meeting in the free world and I saw him sitting there and I asked him to be my sponsor. Cause just, you know, so that's, that's a God thing. You know, that guy just being there that day when I walked in, I really truly believe that. Cause I didn't go to the meeting cause he told me where it was. I just went to the, the, the meeting nearest me is yeah. what I did. Um, and then things started happening. Then I put together a year and a record out and another record. And I'm touring Europe for the first time. And I'm in Amsterdam, which I was terrified of because I used to go to Amsterdam on purpose to misbehave. And I was a heroin addict. It was a great place for heroin addicts <laughs> and, um, <laughs> yeah, right. and, uh, and way safer, you know, it was like safer to do it and safer to buy it and safer to use that people would, if you weren't hurt anybody, you, you could be left alone in those days. Um, but I walk out of the American hotel 
and it's, I'm playing the Paradiso, which is two blocks away. And we planned the trip so that I came in from London on the ferry, went to the hotel, went to sleep, slept most of the day, just because our days and nights were still turned around. And then we only stayed in Amsterdam like 16, 18 hours, just long enough to play the show. And we left for Belgium that night right after the show. My tour manager came over to walk me over to the gig and we go out the side door of the, of the American hotel and we're walking along. Um, it's off the Lidza plane. There's like, um, you know, the grand canal is right next to you. Mm. And uh, on the other side of the canal, when I come out of the hotel, I see this guy and I make eye contact with him for some reason. And he starts walking along parallel to us on the other side of the canal. He gets to the bridge and he turns and comes across. And we're going, we're crossing the other end of the bridge, headed down the canal to where the club was. And he he speeds up and starts walking towards us. And for some reason, I stopped because I realized he was there for me. And I didn't really know what to do. But he keeps walking towards me. And then he sees that I've pulled up and that I might be alarmed. And he and he goes, hey, wait, 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 wait. And he was American. I could tell immediately by his accent that he, he was a Yank. And he has like a, a messenger bag on and he said, just wait. And he reaches in and he pulls out a piece of paper and a pencil and he starts scribbling on it. And he, he walks up, he goes, you're Steve, right? And I said, yeah, who wants to know? And he says, look, you may need to know this and you may not, but there's a meeting in English at this address at six wow. o'clock. Wow. And that, now that guy walking out of there that when I'm walking out, that's a miracle. And, and that, you know, that yeah. was the next thing. And, mm -hmm. um, Mm. It was all recovery related stuff until just a few years ago when I hit that real rough patch and several things happened that sort of, um, that basically brought me to Ramdas and, uh, which is kind of a, it's a weird little sequence of events that happened pretty quickly one after the other. Um, it's, um, first thing that happened and this will sound like I'm really taking a turn. Um, I fish with a fly rod. You know, it's like the only thing I do besides play music and, well, I mean, I paint and I do all these other things. The only thing I do is not really art. And there's some art involved in casting with a fly rod. But um, I don't kill anything anymore. I'll occasionally humiliate a fish before I put him back in the water. I don't eat them, but I do catch them. <laughs> and and you, it's trout don't, live in, trout don't live in ugly places. And I just got hooked on it years ago. And, and something I started doing in recovery, I, I started doing it when I was 40, right after I got, right after I got clean. One of, with one of my sponsors, my, with my first sponsor. So um, I'm fishing in New Zealand, which has huge trout and great fishing. And a really good friend of mine, Cameron Strang, used to own the record label that I recorded for. And um, he, he came over to meet me to go fishing. And I fell wading in a river. It's a very powerful current. And I fell down for the first time wading in a river. And it was embarrassing. And I got up and I got water in my waders and we're in the boat floating down to the next spot and these rubber rafts that, that and it's a big river. And so you just use boats and to cover the spots as you go down the river and then you get out and fish, you don't fish from the boat. But, but, um, I said, man, my core strength is fucking going, you know? And, um, and Cameron said, he said, he said, you know, I've been practicing yoga and it really helps with that. Mm -hmm. And I said, yeah, I know I just never have been able to, I'm, I'm really stiff. I'm not very limber and not very athletic. And he goes, he goes, I said, plus it's embarrassing to go to class. He goes, he goes, look, you spend money on sillier stuff than this. Just, mm -hmm. he goes, I have, I have a private lesson twice a week. So I get back and I start talking about wanting to practice yoga for a while before I did it. And I mentioned it to Danny Goldberg, who's my manager and my best friend. And, um, um, you know, he um, <clears throat> he had already, um, um, he said, well, you know, I'll, I know some people that might know. And then a few days later, I found out I was getting to ready to turn 60 years old. Danny called me up and he said, I, I, for your birthday, there's a small retreat. We talked about Be Here Now. We talked about Ram Dass a lot over the years. And I knew that Danny was acquainted with Ram Dass. And um, so... I, um, I basically, he said, he said for your, he said for your birthday, there's a small retreat that taking place at Ram Dass's house in Maui and I'll take you to, 
to Maui and it's a small enough retreat. You'll definitely, you know, meet Ron Boss. And I said, I'd never been to Hawaii, you know, so <laughs> it was, uh, so that's what my, my, we did from my birthday is January 17th. I think we went around the 20th or so. And uh, it was whenever that retreat was, it was, you know, it was five years ago. Um, and um, there was, um, you know, not very many people there. Um, it was funny. I just, uh, it's like, uh, you know, I met a lot of people that I, that I, that I communicate with all the time that day. And, and uh, it started a thing of, I, you know, Ram Dass, um has trouble speaking. He had trouble speaking because of, you know, he had, the, he had a stroke and it was catastrophic and most people, it would have taken them away from here, but he wasn't done yet and uh, stayed around a long time in that wheelchair and a long time in that cage, you know, and I don't, I would have never been able to do it. I would have just, I wouldn't have had to kill myself. I would have just died. And, um, but he had something that he felt like he, you know, needed to do and needed to say, and he kept doing it, kept saying it. But just when he finally came over and we were introduced right before the, the, retreat stuff formally started and i just think popped into my head i wonder what john henry would think about ron Doss, what ron Doss would think about john henry john henry is my son who's 10 now i was five at just not quite five at the time who has autism and doesn't speak and you know um rd had trouble speaking to the point where that that retreat and all the other ones they used to tag team you know with speakers and and I always loved when he had trouble finishing a sentence that would invariably end with wow. <laughs> that was one of my, I, yeah. I, I kind of, I can't say wow any other way now for, you know, from, from yeah. watching him do that. Yeah. But I just decided that, that I should bring John Henry to Maui to see Ram Dass, And I did it the next year at Christmas time. And I went out to the house and, uh, there's, I don't know. I think I might have shown you the picture. There's an amazing. No, are you kidding? I got to You got to make way more of a big deal I'll, out of that picture, and we got to have that picture so we can show it. I mean, it's phenomenal. I, I think, I think, you know, I think they have it in the household, but I'll send it to you. It's like, um, I know, I, I know, um, I sent it to to somebody, but it's it's an amazing picture. Um, my girlfriend at the time took it, and it's just, it's just uh, John Henry and and. Um, in uh, RD's lap. And then, so we started going every year and he, um, you know, he just wanted me to shut up and wanted to talk to, wanted to talk to John Henry, <laughs> when the guy right there, even though John Henry doesn't talk. And, uh, it was, um, there was a year that I, that John Henry had a really bad cold. So we didn't go. My, I have other, I start going to Maui every year because I have other friends there. Chris Christopherson lives there. Willie Nelson lives there. And so I didn't go see anybody that year because you don't take, the snotty nosed kid to see the octogenarians. It's rude. <laughs> so I just, so we missed one year, but, uh, and then we were looking forward to this year because we would never been there on a Monday before. And we always stay in Kihei anyway. That's our beach that John Henry and I go to that Ram Dass swam at every Monday. Yeah. And we thought we were going to get to go this year. And then he passed away four days before. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. I was there, um, for, um, when we took um, the the swimming rig out there and covered in flowers, I was there for that, and um, I, I'm I got to be there for that. And I went out to the house and sat in Hanuman Garden for mm. about an hour and a half or so, and went 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 and sat in his room for a while and sat in the Hanuman Garden before mm. before we left Hawaii yeah. the last trip. It's I'm gonna go this year, but it's gonna be weird. It's gonna be uh, it was weird enough last time. Um, yeah. I didn't know anything about. Um, Maui without Ram Dass and yeah, uh, right. until this last Christmas and and um and I, I I think I questioned whether I would go again but I've decided I've already booked my ticket I'm 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 going December 25th I'll I'll be headed for Maui mm, mm, December 25th oh boy well we all hope to uh, to be able to go anywhere Steve I mean with well I I think we're gonna be able to go places you know look fear out there is i mean this is a real thing that we have to be really careful about but um there's um the, the richest people in the world are going to be okay because they're going to have decent medical 
care and no matter how what age they are and no matter how unhealthy they are they have way better chance than everybody else does and some of them are going to profit from this when all of this business shuts down and position themselves and that's the way people like that think and that's what they do and that's their nature and I don't have a dog in that fight. It does affect my life. It does everybody else, but I just don't. I'm, I'm okay with them being the way that they are. But I need an audience to do what I do and make a living, so I'm worried about it. But this is a virus, and it's we're gonna. The only way this ends, we're already pretty much everyone exposed to it, and a lot of us have had it, and we're asymptomatic. That's one of the that's kind of vicious about it. As you can spread it and not even be sick. Yeah. You don't okay. spread it forever, though. And we're going to develop an immunity to it, and we're going to develop a vaccine. There's going to be another virus later. Hopefully, we won't have a situation where this virus started in China, and there just happens to be more people there than any place else, and they're traveling all over the world at this point in their history. And that part of it, I'm okay with. They were always going to have their day. There were all such more Chinese people than there are anything else. They were always going to have this mm. moment. Um, they weren't very open when this happened with everybody else. And that's unfortunate and helped put us where we are. And our guys were even, you know, maybe possibly even more dishonest about it when it started. Possibly. Possibly. Yeah. possibly. <laughs> yeah, so, that's a kind so word, Steve. Is, okay. Uh, yeah, it's it's amazing. It's like, um, but it's one of those things. We're going to get through this, and it's going to be. Um, I, I don't know. I'm a hopeless. You know, I, you know, I'm a baseball fan, and <clears throat> everybody asks me like, I'm like, well, what do you think is going to happen? I, I'm a Yankees fan all my life, long before I moved to New York, because I grew up in Texas before we had any baseball. There, you're a Yankees fan or a Dodgers fan, because that's what mm -hmm. you got on TV, and that's just my age and. I grew mm -hmm. up with, you know, Dizzy, Dan and Pee Wee Reese in the game of the week. Mm -hmm. So it, so everybody asked me, you know, especially all these whinging New York Yankees fans in New York that have lived there their whole lives. They're so pessimistic. And they have the, this team that's won more championships than anybody, but they're always whining. And it, it, it's, a, it's a World Series championship or nothing. But the, you ask them what's going to happen. Oh, we're not going to have any pitching. We're not blah blah. And I'm always, what's going? What you think's going to happen? So I said, we're going to the World Series and we're going to win it. And that's <laughs> the way I am the first day of every baseball season. And <laughs> sounds I'm like that's about the world too. I, yeah, I think that's um, it. Yeah, I believe in in. I, I kind of follow. I think Anne Frank was right. I think at you know when it when I'll think this is Anne Frank saying this when she was living in an attic, you know, hiding from the Nazi. She said, you know, when all, I, I'm paraphrasing, but she said when everything is is uh, you know said and done, I think people are basically good, mm. and and I think we are, and I think we'll get through this. I think we'll take care of each other. Maybe we'll get a healthcare system. Maybe we'll decide that maybe the way we were doing it was wrong. I don't know. Yeah. But we have made mistakes and not learned from them before. So it's not a given that we'll get one, but. Yeah. Oh, uh, so great to have you here, Steve. Uh, oh, it's, 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 uh, thank you so much for asking me. It's good to see you. You know, we've been uh, just addressing some of what we've been talking here about in the pandemic. And, you know, we've uh, Ramdas is amazing pre stroke. Of course, we have all of these talks of his forever. And uh, we've been mining those to share with people uh, on a weekly basis, uh, because what he talked about back then is so right on for this moment. It's incredible. Yeah. Um, I mean, he talked about, you know, Anybody with any tiniest bit of equanimity, he said, is going to help coalesce, is going to help create a, a, a safe comfort zone for people. Absolutely. And then, uh, you know, lastly, I'd like to leave us both and everybody who's listening with this, this other thought from Ramdas when he talked about compassion. It's not just about relieving hunger, etc. Okay. It's about cutting through people's feeling of separateness that is so and i looked at that and i read that and i heard him say it and i thought wow that as much as there's fear of dying and fear of loss of income you know all of the all of the the first chakra stuff that's going on so powerfully in this moment to make people confront this at the same time it's the feeling of of being alone and being yeah. separate. I mean, and, and that's what we have to do. 
Absolutely. Yep. Go out of our way to make sure that social distancing doesn't equal social separateness. And it doesn't yeah, exactly. have to because we have technology what we're on right here, right now. Yeah, exactly, exactly, exactly. So everybody out there, you're going to go to BeHereNowNetwork.com slash mindrolling. And we're going to give you all kinds of links for everything that Steve does, which would be a lot of links. Uh, but uh, you'll be able to catch on. And, and if you if there's anybody out there that hasn't heard Steve's music particularly, um, it is so uh, powerfully connected from a heart place that uh, is um, I, I just thank you for what you do, Steve, period. Thank you. And we shall see you all next week on Mind Rolling. <laughs>